So today we'll be talking about deciding where to publish, covering a little bit of the open access and scholarly publishing landscape without Miranda here. I'll do my very best. That's our name and contact info. You're welcome to follow up with either one of us if you have any questions. And today we'll be talking about the scholarly publishing landscape, open access and traditional publishing, and then deciding where to publish. Thankfully, in today's technological world, there are a lot of tools, a lot of options, and the library support for your publishing journey, because it's not always to make easy to make sense of how to start. So the publishing landscape is changing rapidly. I think we're all pretty aware of that. And it's a huge industry. So science, technology, and medicine, academic publishing market is a $20.4 billion industry. And there are some links here that I can drop in the chat toward the end of the class. Uh, and there are Profits are astronomical, 35% and up for the big deal purveyors like Elsevier, Springer, some of those big publishers that you've heard of before probably. And we can see that a library's budget for monographs, books, and things like that have stayed uh, or, or mildly increased over the years, but serials, journals has grown astronomically by 521% since 1986. So libraries are paying a lot for subscriptions to these journals, but sometimes now authors are also paying to publish. So it's a really messy, messy landscape. We're familiar with, with scholarly publishing, with uh, subscription publishing. We've seen this just browsing the internet. If you end up at a news site like the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times, and you'd like to read an article, you often find that you've reached your limit and that you need to pay. And scholarly publishing in journals is not that much different, although it can be very frustrating. And I will say, since you're an affiliate of Towson, you should never have to pay for a PDF because if we don't have it in our collection, we can get it for you through interlibrary loan. But often, especially if you go in through the web, through Google Scholar, you'll run into this page where you need to pay or sign in with your institution because we have a subscription. So let's take a look at research articles and what's going on in this area. This is just an infographic I really like. So we may be familiar, especially since COVID, with the concept of a preprint. So preprints are often prior to peer review, shared in a repository, sometimes for open comment, sometimes prior to submission to a journal. And they were important during COVID because things were changing so rapidly that we needed to have this kind of publishing in order to make decisions about healthcare and practice. Then there's a post print, and this is the peer-reviewed author accepted manuscript that is often prior to uh, copy editing or formatting for the journal. And the post print we'll find with open access is frequently what you're able to share in a variety of different ways. Then they get formatted, copy edited, typeset for the journal, and that's the published version. That's what we're usually looking at when we're finding it on the web on the journal's homepage. And this can be in different types of journals. We'll talk about open access, hybrid, and subscription. Uh, we talked about the versions of research articles. The preprint precedes formal peer review, can be made available in an archive. And we've seen just an explosion of archives like archive, med archive, bio archive. I think there's an arts and humanities open, so open access archive. And sometimes posting is required by the funder. Sometimes the journals require you to take down your preprint upon publication. And some researchers can annotate others preprints. For example, there's a site called Faculty of 1000, F1000, and that invites reviewer comments. And your postprint is your peer reviewed version that doesn't include copy editing, also called the author's accepted manuscript or the author's final manuscript. And you can find these in places like PubMed Central, sometimes your institutional repository, like ours, which is ScholarWorks. I'm not sure I'll do such a great job of explaining it because I find it confusing. Um, I do think there's a lot of taboo about open access, but there shouldn't be. There are some really big benefits 
to open access. So what does open access mean? It's your digital work. It's free to access for everyone. And it's free of many copyright and licensing restrictions, meaning that you can share it in the way that you want. And there are lots of good open access journals. So let's look at subscription publication model versus an open access publication model. And we're see, we'll see that they are not entirely all that different. So both subscription and open access have an editorial board that oversee the workings of the journal, are peer reviewed in a transparent and reproducible way, are indexed in major databases like PubMed, Scopus, JSTOR, et cetera, and they can be profit or nonprofit. Now in subscription, who pays? The readers, like we saw in that screenshot, where if you wanted to access, you paid $30 for a PDF or something like that. And the copyright is usually held by the publisher. So that's your traditional subscription model. In an open access model, the author pays sometimes. These are called APCs, article processing charges. Authors retain the copyright so that they can share it in a way that is appropriate for them. And it's open to the world. And we're seeing this more and more with open access mandates from the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation and others where any federally funded research is required to be open access without an embargo period and without restrictions. So let's try to talk about the different types of open access. And there's more than just green, gold, and hybrid. I think there's bronze, there's black, and uh, a couple other, they've used colors to categorize the types of open access. So green would be open access that is repository based. So sharing in PubMed Central or ScholarWorks or one of the archive sites. And this can include pre-prints pre and post-prints. Gold open access is journal based. So it would be either fully open access or a hybrid journal. Sometimes, but not always, a publisher might charge for ensuring that the manuscript is published open access with those article processing charges. And this is my least favorite because then if they're a hybrid journal, not only are they collecting subscription fees from institutions, but they're also charging article processing charges to authors. So in a way it's double dipping, right? So that's a traditionally subscription journal where some of the articles are open access for another fee to the authors. So why would you publish open access? If you don't want your research behind a paywall, so you wanna make your work findable by others in your field, um, citable, there's a citation advantage. So this article by um, Langham, Putro, Backer, and Regalman, who are librarians actually, is the open access citation advantage real? They found that 47.8% uh, found that it did exist, which means that if, you, if your work is open access, it's more likely to be cited because people can find it and people can use it and there's no paywall. And you may be required to publish open access, especially if you're getting open access funding. So let me just click on this link. Um, Sherpa Juliet is a, is part of a trio of tools that helps us understand researchers' open access policies. So if we wanted to look for a funder policy, and I apologize for my bias, since I'm the health professions librarian, I'm going to look for the National Institutes of Health and search. And so this will explain to you a little bit more about their open access policy, permitted embargo, where you can archive your work. Uh, it can be really hard to make sense of, so a site like Sherpa Juliet is really helpful. The next thing I wanted to show you are author rights, and this is just an example from a journal from Elsevier, which is just a major, major, if not the biggest, publisher. So they give you an overview of their copyright, author rights, and more. But if we scroll down to compare, if you publish open access versus publish subscription in their journal, really it's all very much the same. You retain, um, let's see, author's rights in Elsevier's proprietary journals, 
Whether you've published open access or published subscription, you get to retain patent and trademark, retain the rights to use your research data freely without restriction, receive proper attribution and credit for your work, reuse the material, use and share for scholarly purposes, publicly share the preprint, we talked about preprints, on any website or repository at any time. But when it comes to the postprint or the author's accepted manuscript, open access you can, and subscription you can do it if you use a Creative Commons license. In open access, you can share the final published version, but you can't with subscription. And in uh, with copyright, you can retain the copyright with open access, but not with subscription. So just to show you, there's not that many differences. And sometimes it just comes down to the version that you can share. Sherpa Romeo is another really great site related to Sherpa Juliet. Get it, Sherpa, Romeo and Juliet. Um, and this one talks about author's rights. So I'll paste that here. And this is where you can look up a journal or a publisher. So let's just look at health affairs, see if they're here. So you're going to publish in health affairs and you'd like to know what your rights are as an author. They're going to tell you mostly. <laughs> so um, it'll tell you that it has an open access fee. This is an APC and article processing charge. There's no embargo. The copyright is for the publisher. Publisher owns the work and you can investigate. There's different pathways. So this helps you investigate a journal. So this has been incredibly helpful to me to provide guidance to people who are looking to publish and understand how they can share. And then we've talked a little bit about repositories. I'm keeping it on presenter view just so I can get to these links. So repository makes sure work, open access, and I'm gonna try to get there. This is our Scholar Works at Towson open access repository. And you can submit here. You just need to log in with your TU Net ID. So if you did want to archive your author accepted manuscript or your post print, you're welcome to do that. And PubMed Central, which is uh, if you are working with NIH or NSF, you're probably going to end up end up with some of your work in PMC PubMed Central, which is the open access archive that's included in PubMed, the major platform from the National Library of Medicine. Hopefully a takeaway from today is that you'll walk away knowing that the library can support you in your own decision-making. The, the librarians can visit your department to educate on open access models, traditional models, um, choosing, a work, choosing a journal for your work. So that's what we hope to be here for. And yeah, just talking about open access and everything, right? It's a business model. If it's listed in DOAJ, which is the Directory of Open Access Journals, it has to meet their transparency and best practice guidelines. And if it doesn't, they'll take it off their list. So if you're searching for an open access journal, here's the, here's the uh, guidelines for transparency and best practice. So having uh, transparent peer review and all that. But if we go to the search function and look for a uh, uh, I'll just do music. So you get, we got 122 journals. Now you can look for the ones that have the DOAJ seal, which is just that extra level of quality assurance. You can also look for ones that don't have an article processing charge or ones where the author retains all rights. And it gets, you can see it gets much, much, much smaller. Uh, but they have gone through at least a vetting process to be listed here. At least that's my understanding. So that's, that's one tool that has come up then. Um, let's see, and actually that was my next slide. So it's an excellent resource if you're looking for and being encouraged to publish open access. And then deciding where to publish, this is something that librarians do a lot of. If you come to us and say, well, like I got an email from a journal, but I've never heard of it before, we, we have, ways that we can look it up. So what I normally do, first just Google the journal because I actually did this for someone where I went to the website and at the top of the website, it looked like a normal journal, but as you scroll down, it was talking about beer and brewing, like totally off the map um, weirdness. So it was kind of just like a shadow website and clearly not a real journal. So just Google the journal, take a look at the website, make sure it makes sense. 
then you might look at the people on the editorial board and verify that they're real people because uh, sometimes they might, might either list imaginary people if they're a predatory or low quality journal, or they might uh, list people against their consent. So you might see somebody you know, but you might want to verify with that someone you know, are you really a, an editor on, a, an, on the editorial board for this journal? Another trick I really like is checking Google Maps for the publisher location and doing street view, because sometimes you'll find it's like an open field in the middle of nowhere and it's a made up address. And in that case, I would be a little suspicious. You can um, make sure that they have clear policies. So you want to see a peer review policy listed there and like the time for turnaround, the name, the percentage of acceptance, like what you should expect from this journal. Everything should be clear and you can always ask us. And then there's a lot of hot buzzwords going on right now. And in my opinion, there's a big difference between what would be considered predatory, AKA fraudulent, and what's just maybe a newer journal or a lower quality journal or a journal that's just uh, less recognized. So the fraudulent journals, yes, they're the ones that are sometimes sending you these emails trying to get you to publish and then you publish there, there's no peer review, you're stuck with how to re retract it or you know get it back so that you can publish it somewhere else. So it can be very scary and it's a real problem in academia. And Miranda, my, co my uh, theoretical co-teacher today would call this phishing. So it really is just like phishing. They're looking for you, they want your money and they don't care about your reputation versus low quality journals, these might charge a high APC article processing charge or a low one or sometimes none at all. So it can be hard to tell. And then they might publish at extraordinary rates. And actually, um, yeah, Miranda put the link here, but this just happened recently. Um, Clarivate, who's a huge publisher, just continued a journal um, from a publisher called MDPI because they were publishing like 3000 articles a day. So I'm gonna put a couple links in the chat that you can investigate. And so they were, they were publishing hundreds of thousands of articles per year and conflating their metrics, right? They're, they were having these huge impact factors, but can you really have quality work when you're doing that? So these two articles, talk about these open access mega journals and some of the problems that they're creating in academia. And I won't, I won't go into a lot of detail on that. I'll let you read it on your own. Um, yeah, she put paper mills, that's true. So how can the library help? It's one of my favorite things to do. If somebody comes to me with some questions about a journal, I'll look in Sherpa Romeo, which shows you your author's rights. And I showed you that already. We can look at a couple other tools today, but everything is also linked here. So Sherpa Romeo shows you your author's rights. And then we also have a subscription to Cabell's Journalytics and Predatory Reports. It used to be called the whitelist and the blacklist, but now they call it Journalytics and Predatory Reports. And let me show you how to get to it from our website. On our website, it's a database. So we'll go to databases and we'll go to, here we go no apostrophe, Cavils. So we'll go into Cavils. And the sad thing for Cavils is it's limited. It's, there's nothing really here for health or nursing, but you might find computer science. You'll probably find business economics, education, um, some other things, interdisciplinary. So if we looked for um, education journals, we can do that. Let me make it a little bit bigger. And some of these are not really very, fleshed out. But if we looked at one, let's say Abacus, we see the publisher is Wiley. We see it has an ISSN number, which all reputable journals should have. Uh, we can read more about the journal and go to its website, verify that it's a real journal. And then down here, it gives you some little icons and metrics. So it's saying the peer review for this journal is double blind. You can expect two to three months for peer review with comments, nine to 12 months for publication, there's a plagiarism screen. And then you can go out to the journal website. You can have a lot of tabs open. 
So that's the actual journal website. And here's where you should be able to find the editorial board, the peer review process, and more. And I, I won't go into all that. Um, up here next to journalytics, which are quote unquote, the good journals, we have predatory reports. So these are journals that have a strike against them based on criteria. Again, let's just look at education. Maybe let's do business this time. All right, so nine violations. And what are those violations? Let's look at this one. This is an open access journal. Academic Open Business Management and Information Technology Research Journal, Computer Science. And the violations are here. The publisher hides or obscures relationships with for-profit partner companies. Insufficient resources are spent on preventing and eliminating author misconduct, repeat, repeating plagiarism, self-plagiarism, manipulation. No editor or editorial board is listed. No clearly stated peer review policy, uh, missing issues, missing articles, no abs, no address or fake address. These are pretty big violations, poor grammar. So you wouldn't want your work in a place like that. And so you can always check out predatory reports. Let me just look for another one. Here's one with, here's one with six violations. No editorial board. No policies for digital preservation. They solicit people who aren't in the field. So that's Cabels can give you a good snapshot. Um, there's a couple other tools. Let's see what's important. I want to show you the most valuable ones. We looked at Cabels. Let me look, let me show you a couple other things. So these are journal suggesting tools, and most of them are affiliated with a publisher. You'll see Springer, you'll see Wiley. IEEE, but Jane is journal a publisher agnostic. So here's Jane. And what you would do is insert your title and or abstract. I don't have one made up, so let me just grab, grab one from PubMed. I had this open already. I'm just gonna grab a block of text and go back to Jane, journal author name estimator. And I admit this interface looks a little old, but it does work. And so I've entered in some, some text and I'll say find journals. And here we get a list of journals that are um, the kind of match up with my topics here. So the first one is knee surgery, sports traumatology, arthroscopy, and it's Medline indexed. And Medline indexing can be a, a, a mark of quality because journals that are indexed at Medline go through a rigorous vetting process. If you don't see Medline indexed, you might see PMC. Again, that's PubMed Central. You might see high quality open access. This means that it's listed in the directory of open access journals. But let's go back and look at maybe a, uh, a, a publisher one. So here's Wiley's journal finder, Patello, Ephemeral, Payne. All right, this should help. And it's going to go, okay, so went through my text and it's recommending some journals to me. These are Wiley journals. So if you want, I mean, Wiley's reputable, right? It's a reputable publisher. So you might go through these. And so when people come to me with an article and say, I don't know where to publish, this is one of the things that I might do for them. And if we go back, I won't, I won't show you all of them because there's at least half a dozen but there's a bunch here. So you could try them all depending on your discipline, depending on your topic. Then there are some big sites like Journal Guide and Simago that kind of show you comparisons across journals. So Simago is pulling data from Scopus, but it's made by uh, some university researchers in Madrid. And if we were to look up uh, journal rankings, we can start up here at the top. Then you can drill down to subject areas. So they have arts and humanities, they have um, earth and planetary sciences, health. Let's look at arts and humanities. Then you can drill down even further. It does have ads, unfortunately. Let's look at history. And we get a list of journals here uh, based on SJR, which is a Scopus metric, much like the journal impact factor. 
and an H index. So some different metrics for the journals and some measurements of their citations and publications. And you can link right to them. So we used to. Yeah, that's the journal. So it helps you get a good idea. Sometimes if you land on a publisher's website, it says we're indexed in PubMed, doesn't really mean anything. They might be lying. So please verify that it actually is indexed in something meaningful to you. That's a journal that's called Simago. And let me just put a link here because it's really fun to play around with Simago. And all the tools, like I said, are listed on that guide. So I'll let you play around with them on your own. And uh, let's see. Think, check, submit. That's a, I won't play the video, but we will go to the Think, Check, Submit website. It's just think, thinkchecksubmit.org. This scenario would be if you got an email saying, hey, publish in our journal. And you were like, I don't know. This is a checklist. Uh, is the journal right for your work? Um, here's the check. Here's the checklist. Do you or your colleagues know the journal? So ask around, hey, have you heard of this journal before? Is it easy to discover papers in the journal? Um, can you cross check with information about the journal in the ISS in portal? That's that eight digit number that tells you that it's a journal. Can you easily identify and contact the publisher? So for example, if you were to email them, are you going to hear back? Is the journal clear about the type of peer review it uses? Are the articles indexed and or archived in dedicated services? Is it clear what fees will be charged? Are guidelines provided for authors on the website? Is the publisher a member of a recognized industry initiative? We talked about DOAJ, there's a couple others. I'll put a link in the website, in the chat. It's one of my favorite resources really, because it's just very brief and to the point. That's Think, Check, Submit. And that's my contact info. Um, that's, that's a couple of different ways that we can help you. Hopefully a good overview of the scholarly publishing landscape, which is ever evolving and needlessly complicated. Uh, but I do hope that you'll reach out and share with your colleagues that we're here to help.